Uh, my name's Kirk Winward, and uh, I'm uh, in a retina group here in town. We used to get up here pretty regularly for various conferences and grand rounds, and as life has got busier, it's just harder and harder to do that. Just uh, by way of introduction, I, uh, I'm from Utah. I went to medical school here. Uh, at that time, uh, Moran just said, well, it wasn't Moran. We were over at the main hospital, and we just had two uh, two uh, residents a year. We had the internship, and I, I matched as an intern here, and then went back to Miami to do my residency and fellowship, and, and came back here and uh, uh, joined up with a person. Then we've hired some some people over the year, and we've, right now we've got seven seven people in a retina uh, practice here in town. And one of the things that I end up doing is treating some of the melanomas, and so that's what we're going to talk about here today. Um, we'll, we'll go back in the history just a little bit. Uh, prior to 1960, uh, melanomas were, well, even now they were kind of a feared uh, condition because there's, you know, especially if they're metastatic, there's just really nothing you can do to treat them. Uh, but basically the dogma that we went by uh, back then was when in doubt, take it out. And lots and lots of eyes were nucleated for things that we would never think of doing it now. And, and uh, we tolerated about a 20% misdiagnosis when those things went to path. And uh, as things evolved a little bit, people started to take a little more conservative approach. And we, we started to get better examination techniques, uh, ultrasound. At some point there uh, became uh, developed, we, were, we became better at, at, at diagnosing them, but we still had a fairly high misdiagnosis rate. Uh, there was also, uh, Zimmerman proposed a hypothesis where he noticed that about two years after a nucleation, there was kind of a bump in the death rate from melanoma patients. And so he proposed, well, what happens is during a nucleation, you disseminate a few little cells that then end up about two years from then ki killing the patient. So it made people rethink, you know, how are we doing a favor, you know, being quite aggressive with a nucleation. And so people started to observe them, at least the questionable ones a little bit, and we, we recognized that not all of them grew. And in the mid-1980s, uh, uh, kind of the landmark study was started, the, the COM study, or uh, Collaborative Ocular Melanoma Study. And I was, I was part of that study in my training. And uh, that was really the landmark study that changed the way we treat these. And of course, there's been lots of other information that has come since then. But right now, and, and even then, is one, of the, one of the results of the COM studies was that we recognized that we could get this right uh, diagnosis-wise almost all the time. Uh, in the COM study, when they, uh, those eyes that went to a nucleation, there was, there was less than a 1% misdiagnosis rate. So we feel, unlike probably any other tumor in the body, which if you have a question, well, even if you just make the diagnosis, you almost always biopsy that to confirm the diagnosis. And in the eye, uh, well, we sometimes do needle biopsies now, but, but at least at this time, we weren't doing that. And we made the diagnosis purely clinically, which is a very different way of approaching it, but we are highly accurate. One of the reasons is because unlike anywhere else, we can really see and measure these, these tumors in, uh, in important ways. Uh, so just a, f just a few little facts. It's by far and away the number one ocular malignancy, and they generally tend to be older patients. Uh, the incidence is about six per million per year uh, in the U.S. or in, in countries that have uh, uh, predominant Caucasian races. Uh, 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 certainly Caucasians have a much uh, higher uh, incidence than do pigmented races. That turns out to be about 1,500 new cases per year in the U.S. And m m by and large, it's felt to be a random tumor, at least, at least r as of right now. We don't associate it with sunlight exposure or, or a lot of the other things that, uh, that other uh, cancers have defined risk factors. It seems, it seems more to be bad luck or random than anything else. Other than, as you might expect, uh, conditions that give you more melanocytes uh, can raise your risk of that a little bit. Um, the symptoms, uh, most, the, the number one uh, symptom is none. The majority of these are just diagnosed on a routine exam for which the patient went in to update their glasses or something. If they do have symptoms, probably the thing that I see more than anything else are just kind of ill-defined phytopsias. Uh, just uh, 
the, a lot of these tumors will leak a little fluid and it just seems like fluid under the retina tickles the photoreceptors and your brain interprets that as photopsia. Uh, bigger ones are ones that get associated with, a, with some exudative detachment then can involve your vision or visual field defects or give you distortion. Uh, occasionally somebody you know, lets one go and doesn't show up until they kind of present with neovascular glaucoma or at least marked inflammation and pain. Uh, obviously, we don't see that too often in today's world. Uh, on exam, uh, important findings are sometimes you'll see sentinel vessels. Those are dilated episcleral, conjunctival episcleral vessels over the side of the tumor. As these tumors start to grow, they need to have a, a blood supply and they can recruit that from the choroid and some of them even from the surface of the eye. Occasionally there's a mild iritis, but I would say that's a little uncommon. Occasionally there's a high pressure. Again, that would be more in the and more advanced ones that are shedding some pigment, clogging the trabecular meshwork. Uh, you might see some pigmented cells in the AC and vitreous, but mo most of the time you don't see that either. Uh, about three quarters of them are pigmented, a quarter of them are amelanotic. Uh, most are kind of dome shaped. And like so many things in ophthalmology, uh, it's pattern recognition. And that's one of the things I'm, we're just gonna go through and see some pictures of a number of them because once you've seen a, you know, a half a dozen or a dozen or something, then it's a lot more easily recognized. Uh, a few of them do tend to be kind of a diffuse infiltrative tumor or ring-shaped right around the ciliary body. Again, those are fairly uncommon. Uh, one of the things that um, you always want to take home from lectures like this, or what are they likely to ask you on the boards? This is often a board question here, a collar button lesion. That is nearly pathognomonic for melanoma almost pathognomonic. And the reason for that is, is these tumors, you know, they grow under Brooks membrane, and Brooks membrane is reasonably tough, and it takes kind of a tough tumor or whatever to rupture it. So metastatic lesions or others, they, they usually don't. The Brooks membrane kind of traps them and they kind of pushes them down and they just spread out more diffuse and flat. But for melanomas, they have a little more solidity to them or a little more uh, form and they will sometimes rupture Brooks membrane and then it kind of becomes like a little tube of toothpaste where some of the tumor kind of squirts up through that little rupture and forms this little uh, mushroom type or collar button lesion. So if you see a collar button lesion on the boards mark melanoma and you'll be right. Uh, I remember one of them that I, I treated not too long ago. Um, uh, a, pa a patient from the VA, they came up and we, uh, we, we treated him with a plaque and uh, I saw him like a, a month or so afterwards and they looked great and then, the, then I got a call from their ophthalmologist down there that said this tumor is just really growing and uh, you know, we got to send him back up and that's, uh, as we'll get to in a minute, that's really rather unusual. We have exceptionally good success rates with treating these tumors these days. So I was a little suspicious of that, and when the tumor, when the patient came up, sure enough, that tumor that had been just a dome shape, it now had this big collar button shape, which made it quite a bit taller to look at. But when I looked at it, it also looked to me like the sides were somewhat flatter. So when we had Roger Harry do his ultrasound, sure enough, he measured it probably twice as thick, but the overall volume of it uh, looked the same or smaller, and so. Uh, we opted, what I thought would happen is it just had ruptured Brooks membrane and just squeezed up through and so rather than rush that eye to a nucleation, we just watched it and it's just continued to shrink and that's exactly what happened. We have a dead tumor, but one that just ruptured through Brooks membrane. Uh, now here's another thing that uh, that you may well see on the boards. There's Shields Five Factors, Jerry Shields from Philadelphia. Uh, w one of the concerns has been that you know, if we can diagnose this tumor earlier, since, since if it once gets out of the eye, it's basically a fatal tumor. We just do not have a treatment for it once it's out of the eye. And so he's looked at how can we, how can we treat these earlier and yet, you know, not enucleate or, or irradiate too many eyes. And initially he came up with these three, five factors that if it's greater than two millimeters thick, if there is subretinal fluid, if there are symptoms, if there's this orange lipofusin spotted or speckled pig, sp pigment on the surface, and if the margin is within a, you know, a few millimeters of the disc, then that makes them more likely to, to eventually turn into a melanoma. In fact, he said, oh, I always hit the wrong button. He said that if you have three or more of those, then that will predict about a 50% growth. You still want to be a little bit careful about, I mean, you don't want to have a 50% 
misdiagnosis uh, rate. So we still tend to often watch those, but he subsequently added a couple of other factors to that, and, and so now it's become this little mnemonic, to find small ocular melanoma using helpful hints daily. And again, here's what we have. Two, or the, uh, the T for the thickness, fluid, symptoms, orange pigment, uh, margin within margin within three millimeters of the disc, ultrasonographic hollowness, and the absence of halo, uh, kind of a depigmented ring around the tumor, or drusen. And that's, uh, actually we'll come back and look at a, a couple of these a little bit later, why the absence of that might be predictable. So in other words, that that's often ends up being another board question, is that little mnemonic there. So we're just going to go through and look at a, a few tumors. Here's one that has this little clumped orange lipofuscin pigment. Uh, we think that that probably uh, represents breakdown of more rapidly growing tumors compared to a nevus. Uh, a nevus, you'll often have drusen over, you have chronic changes. Uh, you know, if a nevus has been there for a long time and hasn't been changing, then you'll see what we, what we think of as chronic changes, like drusen, yellow drusen, or black pigment, just a pigment metaplasia. But if you have a more metabolically active lesion, then some of those breakdown cells as they're turning over end up being some of this lipofusin pigment. Uh, here's one that you, know, you might consider that a little collar button. I have some, I have some better examples of that. Uh, again, just a dome-shaped dome lesion, uh, pigmented or amelanotic. Uh, here's one. Um, I find this kind of an interesting one here. You can see the orange pigment here, and you can see some drusen here. In my mind, th what this was is this was probably a nevus right here and it has some of these chronic findings like that. And can you see how this side is bigger? It's, it's like wider there. I think this was probably a nevus, and somewhere right in here of it, uh, some cells underwent malignant degeneration, and then those cells started to grow, and they end up having some more typical features there. And I actually think this same patient shows up a little bit later here. Um, again, just, a, just another lesion, another lesion there. We'll just toggle through a bunch of these here quickly. Here's one that has a bit of a collar button there. This kind of pigment is the kind of pigment that makes you think chronic. That makes you think melanoma. Now here's another collar button. This, this one is, a, I think, a really good example of you know, probably some toothpaste squeezing up there. Sometimes you'll see a little hemorrhage associated with it. You usually don't see a lot of hemorrhage, although I am going to show you one that we did. Again, here's another collar button lesion. And often in these AE melanotic ones, you can see the tumor vessels, you know, the retinal vessels that come over the top, and then the larger tumor vessels that are down inside the lesion. And, and these are one, some of the things that you'll look for on angiography. Um, again, one more. Here's a smaller one with just a little fleck of hemorrhage there. And this is one, this one ended up being kind of a challenging one to treat because it was an amelanotic tumor here. I'll, I'll show you in a minute how we actually go through the surgery and, and one of the things we do is we transilluminate the eye to kind of localize the tumor so we can get the plaque in the right place. Well, amelanotic tumors don't transilluminate very well, but or don't block transillumination, but blood sure does. So when we got in there and, and started transilluminating this eye, all we were finding is where the tumor wasn't actually. In the, uh, so that can sometimes be a little complicating factor is treatment. Uh, I think we're just about done with these. Okay, so a differential diagnosis. By far and away, a nevus is the, most of it boils down to is this a nevus or is this a melanoma? Uh, sometimes a discoform, I'll get patients sent in with a discoform scar, uh, wondering if it's a melanoma. More often, uh, this is probably the one that gets confused more often than others is kind of a peripheral CNV lesion uh, that created a, you know, a, a hemorrhagic PED out in the periphery. Uh, ultrasound can usually sort those out. Ultrasound and angiography, you don't, you don't see it. You see blockage by the blood rather than tumor tissue, and, and Roger can almost always distinguish between blood and cells, and so those are usually fairly easy to sort out. Uh, melanocytoma is another uh, lesion of uh, melanocyte origin. Uh, it tends to be more jet black, usually around the optic nerve, often with kind of a feathery appearance. Uh, congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium, that's, that's often fairly readily distinguished, but uh, when you get out in practice, if you're in any kind of a referral center, anything that looks weird often will get sent in to you. Uh, hemangiomas, can, uh, they can be 
uh, sometimes difficult to sort out from an amelanotic lesion. They, they, they tend to be more orange rather than white, so they're not, they're not really amelanotic. Uh, uh, usually an angiogram will sort that out. You'll see the vascular uh, pattern in it. Uh, reactive RP metaplasia, that's usually fairly straightforward to sort out. And metastatic lesions can sometimes be a little confusing. Often you'll have a history of, of uh, primary tumor somewhere, but not always. Uh, they tend to, they're more likely to be multifocal. I mean, if you think about it, they're, they're often, if they make it to the eye, they're usually spread hematogenously. They end up in the posterior pole where most of the blood flow goes first. And, and it's not surprising that you would have kind of two or three nodules sometimes merging together. Um, they also have a little bit of uh, uh, a different ultrasound a, a appearance. Okay, so some s findings that suggest that the lesion is benign, as we've talked about. Th these are all things that suggest chronicity. Uh, if there's drusen, we talked about that. Uh, coronal vascularization, usually um, you, you see that more, uh, far more often with the nevus than you do with the melanoma. It just seems like it needs to be there long enough and irritating the pigment epithelium long enough to finally cause a little weakness in Brooks' membrane where some vessels can finally pop through. Um, I had a, uh, a neurosurgeon recently sent in with what they were all worried uh, was a melanoma. And, and I mean, it had a classic CNV lesion, right, associated with it. It had given him symptoms. It was just temporal to his macula. And of course, he was a young guy, uh, uh, only been out in practice maybe four or five years. And he, you know, this was a potentially career-threatening thing. And, uh, but we just, we just gave him a little Avastin and it shrunk, the CNV shrunk away and we watched him now for a number of years and nothing has grown, that's all that was. A hypopigmented margin, this is that absence of halo in Bruce Shields' mnemonic. Uh, again, if, if the nevus has been there for a long time, sometimes there's just a little chronic irritation around the edge of it, causing the pigment epithelium to depigment. And uh, so if you see a, a lesion with a white ring around it, it's far more likely to be a nevus. And th those dark or, or black-like RP changes over the surface, again, a, a sign of chronicity. And here's just a few of them, uh, some typical Drews, obviously that one's not a very big one either, but, but that on top of it is a, is a very positive sign. A very thin one under the macula, obviously thin, I guess, is another one that uh, uh, nevi are, can be very thick, but more often are, are much thinner. Here's some RP metaplasia, perhaps trauma or something in the periphery. Uh, on the workup, you basically just do a good eye exam. You get an ultrasound and you look for low to medium reflectivity as opposed to a nevus that is usually more highly reflective. And you look for vessels in them. Uh, they tend to be more vascular than nevi. They're more metabolically active tissue. They have to recruit and grow more blood vessels to make them survive. Uh, you'll do, we almost always do a fluorescein angiogram. There are no specific findings on angiography that really help you to make the diagnosis. I mean, we look for some little punctate leakage in a, a tumor vascular pattern, but m more than anything, that's probably to just kind of rule out some other things, make sure you're not misdiagnosing a hemangioma or something. Uh, the definitive thing, or if you are still wondering about it, is you watch them for growth. And, uh, nevi can grow, but they tend to grow very little over many years, and, and melanomas are definitely quicker than that. And, and then we certainly can do me needle biopsies. We'll, we'll probably talk a little bit more about that in a, in a minute here. Here's just an angiogram. You often get these, these little punctate hot spots. They're you know, like, like new vessels in most places in the body. They tend to be incompetent and tend to leak, and, and if you have uh, metabolically active mass with a lot of vessels in it. You get lots of these little hot spots that just kind of give you that diffuse leakage late in the angiogram. Uh, before we treat these, we always get a metastatic workup. Uh, I often leave some of the details of that up to their primary care physician. Uh, but basically a physical exam just to make sure you don't see signs of you know, metastatic lesion uh, elsewhere. Um, that's pretty rare to see other than late in the disease. Just a routine CBC, LFTs to see. This, this tumor primarily goes to the liver. If, it, if it's metastatic, it, it often ends up everywhere, but the liver is where that gets diagnosed 90% of the time. Uh, we'll get a chest x-ray. Again, it's kind of rare to find it in the lungs until late. And, and so this is probably the most important one, is some kind of an imaging test of the, of the abdomen or liver. Um, in, in the ones that we treat, I mean, rarely does somebody come in with a big tumor. Almost always this is negative. 
uh, does an important thing that I always spend quite a bit of time with the patients emphasizing does not mean the tumor is not already out of the eye, it just means it's too small for us to find. Uh, choroidal melanomas are very different than cutaneous melanomas. They spread hematogenously. They like to seed the liver, and it seems like it likes to be dormant there for some time and then subsequently reactivate. So that's where you're going to put your money. But when we're treating these, at the time we're treating these, uh, you know, I think in all the years I've been doing this, I, I think there's just one I found where we thought it was metastatic before we treated it. Uh, an important thing is once they have metastatic disease, uh, in the COM study, the, the uh, average survival was less than six months. Um, it's, it's a bad tumor if it once gets out of the eye. So we want to go through the COM study since it was a, a landmark study. So collaborative ocular melanoma study started in 1986. They somewhat, I was going to say arbitrarily, I mean this was based on their best uh, thought process at that time as, they, as, the, uh, as the investigators sat in a room and hammered out how are we going to do it. But, but obviously, if you're gonna, they, they divide the tumors into three categories and so they had to decide on a size to do that and, and they, they div divided them into small, medium and large. And they defined these are small was less than two and a half millimeters. Thick. Actually, initially it was three millimeters and partway through the study we thought we got good enough that we dropped it down to two and a half millimeters. Uh, large were greater than eight millimeters thick or a base greater than 16. And th uh, the way this came about was most of them, th uh, most of the investigators thought that if you're going to irradiate a tumor that big, th since, since you, you treat to the apex of the tumor, that's where you calculate how much radiation you give them. So a thicker tumor gets an overall higher dose of radiation, so the apex gets, uh, gets this, you know, usually around 85 gray is what we target. Uh, that's enough radiation that you can kind of expect that that eye is not going to do very well. And, um, and ones that are bigger than 16 millimeters, we like to have a two millimeter margin around the edge of the, uh, the lesion. So if we have a 16 millimeter tumor, we've got to put a 20 millimeter plaque around that. And beyond 20 millimeters is just technically difficult to, to get a plaque bigger than that and fit it in the eye and not have to remove so many muscles and other things that you end up with a bad result anyway. But the purpose of the study was kind of twofold. One is to decide whether plaque one could treat the tumor well, but probably more importantly is what does it do to the death rate? Because that was the big concern. People had started to, to treat these with plaques before this, but the argument was, well, yeah, you save a few eyes, but you send more people to the grave. Is that worth it? And so that, that's kind of the main indicator right there is what was the death rate. And then on these larger ones, it was kind of the Zimmerman hypothesis. If, if we irradiate them before we enucleate them and you know, kill those cells, so if we cause some dissemination of cells or dead cells, you know, does, that, does that change the death rate? And the results were that pre-radiation had no benefit. It added complications and exp expense, did not change the death rate, kind of put the Zimmerman hypothesis to rest. Uh, the plaque treatment, there was no increased death rate. In fact, technically, there was a slight trend towards longer survivability with uh, plaque, interestingly. Um, we were kind of left to speculate why that would be. Again, that was not statistically significant. We say that there was no difference, but, but it actually favored the plaque slightly. And one of the things that we might, after the fact, attribute to that is, you know, well, maybe these tumors are causing a little bit of an immune response that if you remove the tumor, your immune response goes down. And if there is a hidden cell somewhere, you don't have that low-grade immune response still working. Whereas if you have some dead tumor cells still there in the eye, it might kind of keep that going. It might kind of work on those other ones. Again, speculation, but, but a possible explanation. And we also kind of another thing was is we saw that the small tumors could, in fact, be observed with little change in uh, little, uh, with no measurably different change in the, in the death rate. So it made us more comfortable in, in watching the suspicious ones or the, or the inconclusive ones. So the conclusions that kind of came out of this were if they're small, most of the time we just observe those to see if they grow before we're going to treat them. We consider Schild's risk factors and, the, and the, you know, the health of the eye and the age of the patient and all those things, but most of the time we end up watching those for a while. And if they do grow, it often, you know, it's often not a few months, it's often a few years before you pick that up. They're, 
a, a small volume of tumor. They, we think they have a, you know, once they are a, quote, melanoma, they probably have a fairly steady doubling rate. But if you have a small tumor doubling, it just doesn't seem like it's growing as much as a big tumor doubling. So uh, we, we figure Roger is probably accurate to, with, Roger Harry is probably accurate to within about a tenth of a millimeter. I mean, his, his, his uh, error of uh, reproducibility. So if it grows a couple of millimeter, I'm sorry, not a millimeter, a tenth of a millimeter. If it grows a couple of tenths of a millimeter, boy, that's not very much. But uh, uh, that still often takes, uh, you know, a year or two or three is in, in my experience. Uh, if they're a medium-sized tumor or a large tumor, if you look at the clinical and, and and uh, 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 angiographic appearance. <clears throat> Consider that, <clears throat> excuse me, how typical that is for melanoma. You look at the ultrasound, you know, do they have low to medium internal reflectivity and high vascularity <clears throat> and growth? Those are kind of, we kind of categorize things into those three. If you have two of the three, I'm usually ready to treat right off the bat. And if there's something that, you know, if the, if the appearance is atypical or the ultrasound or there's something's atypical, then we'll watch those for a little bit before we treat them. But most of these that come in into this size range, we usually figure we know the diagnosis the first day we see them and, and move forward with, with treatment of some type. And in the large ones, uh, we just you know, we usually send those to a nucleation other than a, uh, I just got one from you guys the other day, a patient that has a permanent car keratal prosthesis in one eye and lousy vision and now has a subfoveal melanoma in her other eye. That's a challenging situation there. Anyway, if they're, if they're small, we either observe them for growth, and then when they grow, we do, we do some kind of a vision-sparing treatment, a medium. We recommend vision-sparing treatment, and the large we generally will enucleate. Uh, we ought to look at the various other options. I mean, most of these end up in the U.S. getting plaque or brachytherapy, but uh, there's, I have one patient that I know she has a melanoma, and I'm just watching it, and I've been watching it for over 20 years now. Uh, she is now 90-some years old. It took about 10 years before it grew. And so that told me that this is probably a spindle A or a very inactive spindle B tumor. Oh, I actually didn't mention that, so uh, you're nodding your head, so uh, Nick has told you about these, I guess. Uh, we we kind of categorize them into pathologically spindle A, spindle B, uh, mixed, and epithelioid, and their kind of aggressiveness follows in that same order. So I know hers is a, is a low-grade melanoma. It's in the periphery. She has great vision. Um, and we've just been watching it. I see her twice a year. Uh, it's now still only about three and a half millimeters thick, so it's still a fairly small one. But interestingly, she had a sister who died from a choroidal melanoma. So she's, we've had a, a few discussions about what that means over the year. But I, I, every year I tell her, you know, we can treat this if you want. We can probably treat it without causing any visual loss but you're gonna die of something else. And if it were me, I, and I were 90, and I had a three and a half millimeter melanoma, I'd be watching it. Uh, nucleation for big ones, or you, occasionally you get somebody who's just so nervous they can't stand to have cancer in their eye, and even though you recommend otherwise, they want it out. Plaque radiotherapy is the main way we, we treat that, and I'll walk you through how exactly we do that in a minute. Uh, proton beam radiotherapy is, it seems to be as good as plaque therapy. Uh, it's just another way of giving a localized dose of radiation. We don't treat these with external beam radiation. That just that gives you radiation all through the beam course, whereas a proton beam has a magic way of just making the radiation unload at a given, at a given point. And there's, you know, there's just a handful of places around the country that have a proton beam accelerator. And, uh, they tend to be somewhat more expensive, but if you have one, you use it, so you pay for it, I guess. And, and everywhere else, we do plaques. Uh, trans uh, uh, trans pupil th uh, uh, tr uh, trans pupil thermal therapy um, is it, uh, it had a still occasionally do it, but not very often. There was a short window of time when that looked promising. That's kind of a, a heat induced laser that kind of burns them. It's, it's different than a, like your argon laser that coagulates them. It, it just heats the tissue but kills it. But it, it ends up leaving a scar very similar to what, a, what an argon laser would. It, uh, um, and so it can't penetrate very deep. That's one of the challenges. In fact, that's um, the next thing up here is laser and cryo. Uh, you just can't treat very thick with a laser. 
you know, if, especially if it's a pigmented lesion, it will absorb the power. If it's, if it's an amelanotic one, then you're, it's really difficult to laser those. But if it's a pigmented one, you can burn a little ways into the tumor and kill the cells. It's just you can't burn very deep. So you end up having to treat again and again, and that only works for relatively th thin tumors in isolated places. And it's kind of the same thing with TTT. Uh, TTT ha has a propensity to cause a vein occlusion if you uh, treat over a vein, so that also eliminates some other ones. But uh, I'll show you an example of one we did end up treating like that. Uh, uh, local resection, uh, again, not done a lot, but uh, basically you create a trap door in the sclera and shell out the tumor and hope you get it all. Um, so uh, metastasis, uh, you know, you can look at risk factors, uh, older patients, uh, increased size of the tumor. Uh, ciliary body location definitely has a little higher risk. Uh, epithelioid cell type, uh, more aggressive tumors, more likely to spread. Um, there's extraocular extension. We don't, that's really rare. We always, we always send it up here to Nick to look at. It's really uncommon that you, you, you see it. It spreads hematogenously. And then, we, then there are genetic markers, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, the incidence of metastasis, um, any article you read will usually say up to half of patients die from metastatic disease. Uh, I think that half percent number comes from uh, I mean, it comes from papers in the literature, but it comes from papers that looked at larger, you know, if, if your set of patients has more of them that started out as a larger tumor, you're more likely to see that. In the COM study, at 10 years, uh, there was less than 20% that died from, the, from metastatic disease. So it's somewhere in there, 50% uh, often is the number that's thrown around when people are talking about it. Uh, but it certainly seems less in my experience. I have much less than 50% of my patients die from it. Again, there's still, there's a number of, uh, uh, oh, there's always an experimental protocol somewhere where somebody's figured out some new combination of chemotherapeutic agents to test these patients with. So far, there's nothing that's been shown to be effective. Uh, uh, this, is a, this is one of the things that gets talked about most right now, and I, w I would think there's a fairly high chance that you'd see something of this on the boards. The genetic analysis uh, uh, or expression of this tumor. We, we said that it was just kind of a random tumor, or, or it, it's just popped up randomly, uh, just kind of bad luck to get it. But it, it seems to be that a, at least a large number of them, it's, it's due to a random mutation, not a mutation that you inherited. It's very rare to see this run in families. But, but just one of those random mutations that, that triggers melanoma cells to go. So initially, when this uh, information first came out, uh, monosomy 3 uh, seemed to be the big risk factor with a much higher incidence of metastasis if the tumor had that than if it didn't. But there were, you know, it wasn't always that. There was you know, a number of other things that were looked at, and so people started to look at various combinations of these things. And then the, the thing that has come out recently, well, recently in the last maybe four years or so, gene expression profiling, or GEP. And what that looks at, it's a, it's a, a, a PCR assay of 15 different gene products, and it's commercially available now. That's what kind of really turned the corner on us being able to do it. It was not just a, you know, expensive research test that could be done in one place in the world, but it, but it's commercially available, and uh, and then it will it will categorize the tumor in either a class one or a class two, and and class one has a much much lower risk of metastasis, and class two has a high risk of metastasis. And this type of information makes a lot of us think that, uh, you know, your prognosis kind of depends on which, on what, what the genetic makeup is of that tumor. Because if you have the bad genes, that tumor probably disseminates very early on, and you're probably dead before you realize it, no matter what we do. <clears throat> and uh, because because even sometimes when we treat these little small melanomas, the patients still you know die down the road. And on the other hand, if you have a, a class one set of markers, then um, you know th this patient I just talked to you about that has the keratoprosthesis, prosthesis. I'm hoping she has this because if she does, she can let that tumor grow under macula for a long time and still have. She'll probably keep really good vision in that eye for for years as long as we don't do something to make it bad. Uh, and she would have a low risk of, of death. But uh, uh, 
Uh, again, no test is 100%, and so if you're class one, you can't sleep easily because it doesn't always so, and, and if you're class two, you don't have to you know, go do your bucket list immediately because not all of those do, do die. But, but it, the, the rates are very different between those two. I'll often get a, you know, I'll get a, what actually comes back to me when we send that in is something that says this is a, you know, this is a, they actually split the class into 1A and 1B and they say, you know, this patient has a, you know, 98% chance of being metastasis free at five years and a, 92% chance at 10 years. I mean, those are fairly nice numbers. And if it comes back class two, then it's, you know, you have a 60% chance of five years having had metastatic disease. And uh, so it's helpful, and it's helpful in counseling the patients, but it's, but it's not 100% accurate. The other challenge that we have with that, and, and it's, a, it's a challenge that I struggle with, is that even though we can get this information, um, it doesn't really change what we do as far as, um, I mean, if it, since we don't have a treatment for it, you have to ask yourself is how important is it to have this information because what are you gonna do? You're, you're, you're still usually gonna treat those eyes unless there's some extenuating circumstances like the one patient I mentioned. <clears throat> and then you're gonna have to follow them postoperatively to look for metastatic disease. And the question is, is how much money do you spend and how much risk do you give that patient with CTs, you know, scanning their abdomen every six months or something, um, if for a disease that you can't treat? Because the, 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 you could argue that you don't even need to do post-operative screening unless the patient just wants some advance notice, since it doesn't really change what you're gonna do. The other thing is, is it's not entirely benign to do a, a needle biopsy. I mean, mo most people will say that risk is low, but there have been at least four cases where you had seeding of the tumor along the needle track. Uh, those were eyes that didn't have to have a metastatic disease in my mind, and, and if you can't treat them, I wonder if we help those patients at all. And, um, and then you also have the risk of uh, you know, false biopsy, especially in thin tumors like this, this keroprosthesis patient. I'm not gonna put a needle in that one. It's, you know, it's just two and a half millimeters thick. I mean, the bevel of your needle is not much less than that. And to get, make sure you're in the tumor, get a good sample, you're not sampling choroid or retina, um, that's, that's a little tough to do. And, and then you know, we could seed the tumor along the track. We might give her a subretinal hemorrhage in her macula. We might give her retinal detachment. Uh, all of those things, in my mind, are things that they don't change the eventual outcome other than maybe give you some prognostic factors. And I, I tend to, to be one that does very few needle biopsies, other than in eyes that I nucleate. Once the eye's out of the head, then I always take a sample and send it for the gene expression profile. All right, well, here's how we actually go through what we do for most of these patients. So we have a custom plaque. It's designed specifically just for that patient. Uh, we use uh, iodine-125 seeds. Uh, you'll see a picture of them. They look like little fragments of pencil lead. Uh, a key thing is, is to place it directly over the tumor with no intervening tissue. You want to make sure you have tenons out, muscles out, no reason to irradiate a muscle. All that does is hold the plaque a little farther away from the eye and reduce your dose. Uh, you know, th th these little seeds are kind of magic in that they give a real high dose of radiation right next to the source and almost none even on the other side of the eye. So unless the tumor is real close to the optic nerve or the macula, we usually have great vision in these. Um, we, we treat them with, in comms, we treated them with 85 gray and <clears throat> to the tumor apex and people will sometimes vary that just a little bit. And what that means, for most patients, it means that we put the plaque on, we leave it there for about four days, and then we take it off. Uh, we get a little printout that you know, gives us a million uh, numbers there that they usually don't mean too much to me other than what time I'm supposed to take that plaque off. Uh, Here's how we go through the, the actual surgery. You, you've got to expose the quadrant, so you take down conjunctiva like you were doing a scleral buckle or something. You isolate the muscles. There's a couple of muscles on traction sutures. You expose the quadrant you're after. Then you transilluminate the eye, and you'll see the tumor right here. And you can see a dark line right there. That's actually, I've already marked that one with a marking pen. You just transilluminate the eye and just draw a circle around it. Now you've got it marked. I always double check that. Um, 
with a little scleral depressor here very carefully, uh, especially if you have a more columnar shaped tumor, uh, depending on your angle of where your transillumination source is, you can sometimes cast the shadow a little bit differently. So I just double check it this way to make sure that where I've marked is in fact the base and the edge of the tumor and not just a little bit off because that's the key to making this surgery work is you've got to get the plaque in the right place. And this is what it looks like. We, ha we have a dummy plaque that we work with until we're ready to get the live plaque out of the little lead can. This is what the live plaque looks like, the, the outside of it. They're gold. And, um, uh, and then the inside it has a little rubber matrix and then all these little fragments of the I-125. And uh, this is probably a 16 millimeter plaque and, and 13 seeds there. And, uh, and so now that we have the tumor exposed, and we take the dummy plaque, and we hook it on there and we secure it with three little 5 nylon sutures and until we get it just right, making sure we have you know, a two millimeter margin around the tumor. And again, I check that both externally. You can kind of see my little mark underneath there. That's uh, my pen marking there. And internally, just a little gentle scleral indentation to make sure we're perfectly centered on the tumor. And once everything is good, then we just unhook the, or just a close up of it again. And we just untie those sutures and, uh, and thread them through the corresponding eyelets on the live plaque and put the live plaque on. And then we just close tissue over top of that. And the patient goes home for four days and then they come back and we just, uh, it's usually pretty easy to snip those sutures and pull that out and they're good to go. Uh, the, the challenges we run into sometimes with the big ones, um, well, e even with the others, there, you know, with six muscles inserting in the eye, there's, there's probably at least half the time there's one muscle insertion that's in, in the way. And uh, so we'll temporarily have to take down a muscle and, and then hook it back up at the end. Uh, on the big one, sometimes there's two and three, and you guys know what can happen. You start taking off several muscles. You, not only do you increase your risk of diplopia, but you can get an ischemic syndrome from, from having too many. Again, we generally, I've never had an ischemic uh, a syndrome, but uh, uh, even if you don't have to take down a muscle, uh, double vision, you still get a low percentage of that. Wherever you radiate makes that area real sticky and any muscle that has to pull across that, very often you'll get a little adhesion in that area and it doesn't pull, I shouldn't say very often, but occasionally it doesn't pull the same way and you, and you end up having to deal with some double vision afterwards. Again, almost everybody's double while the plaque's in place because they just can't move their eye very much and then they're often double for a few weeks afterwards as the muscles are sore and are healing, but most are not diplopic long term, but a few are. You just put a patch on them, send them on their way home. All right, so here's just, a, here's just one result. You can see this amelanotic tumor right here, treated with a plaque, poor vision because there was fluid in the macula, five and a half, or 5.2 millimeters thick, and seven months later, vision include, improved to 2040 and now about a two millimeter tumor. So they're not always this dramatic, but they often are. I mean, as I said, we have nearly, we, we just reviewed our, um, you know, we reviewed over a little, a little over 100 uh, cases of these. We, I've had, in, in all the 20-some years I've been doing this, I've only had one tumor recur, and that was in a patient that I told her the plaque wouldn't work, that her tumor was just too big. Uh, it was kind of curving around the optic nerve. That, that's the other place where you run into a little problem is, you know, the, out, the nerve on the outside of the eye has a, you know, a myelin sheath around it, so it's a little bigger than the nerve on the inside of the eye. And if the tumor abuts the nerve, and spe especially if it kind of curves around the nerve a little bit, you can't get a round plaque outside of the eye to cover it all. So we, we use a notched plaque in those situations, and, uh, and we still get very good results. But her tumor was just so big, I said, I recommended a nucleation. She just absolutely refused. So we treated it with a plaque, and it, it, she, she did well for you know, three or four, maybe even five years, and then she got a little recurrence along one margin, and, and we ended up re removing her eye at that point. But that's the only one we haven't had knock on wood, because I'm sure at some point we'll get others, but, but right now we're running almost 100% local tumor control. Um, about two-thirds of successfully treated ones shrink. They don't have to shrink as long as they don't shrink. I mean, as long as they don't grow, they're equally dead. Uh, in my mind and, and some other people, we think that the ones that are likely to shrink a lot are probably the more epithelioid tie. That actually may be a bad sign. Patients are usually really happy if they come in, oh, my tumor's a lot smaller. And in my mind, I usually don't say anything, but I think, oh, that was maybe a bad tumor. You maybe have a little greater risk of metastasis. Whereas like a spindle A, you know, it's a more solid tumor. There, 
you know, a dead spindle A cell may not shrink hardly at all. Uh, uh, again, you know, anywhere from some studies as low as 5%. It, it kind of depends on how big the tumors were in your study and how long you followed it. If you have a 10-year study, you show more dye than if you have a 5-year study. And if you have more big tumors, you have more dye. Uh, here's, the, here's one patient that we did treat with transpupillary thermotherapy. Um, you know, it, it has to be a fairly thin tumor, and you usually don't like it under a major artery, but it gives you this really dense scar. You don't get surrounding collateral radiation damage, but with the plaques, you often don't get too much. But you, you do get a very dense scar right there. And this is a very happy patient because she has another good eye, and she was terrified of her tumor. But she's, uh, she's been, you know, 22 or 20. 200 and 2400 ever since we treated it, where she was pretty close to 2020 when she came in. And, um, uh, but anyway, that's life with your tumor. You kind of have to live with where it, where it grew. Uh, here's just a couple of cases and then we'll, we'll finish thing up. And a, a couple of these, uh, uh, you know, these were from, uh, again, I was at, in Miami at the time the comms was getting underway. And so before that time we had, you know, different of our doctors there. Uh, managing things a little differently and some of them were a little more conservative than the others. So these are a couple of pictures that I can show you now that I don't think I could could generate again because we wouldn't have watched these. So this is a 75 year old man, uh, good vision but he had noticed a little decline and the ultrasound showed 2.9 millimeter thick tumor so not too thick, uh, kind of a more nevus like uh, echo pattern, internal reflectivity pattern. I, the other thing I'll mention is that uh, you also have to take the internal reflectivity with a little grain of salt in thin lesions because there's just not as much tissue there for Roger to measure. You get a thicker tumor, then there's a lot of tissue and he can give you a better pattern. And if you have a, you know, uh, you know two, two and a half millimeter lesion, there's just not as much for him to, to try to recognize a pattern within that. Anyway, so uh, you just watch, kind of watch these blood vessels here and I'll show you. So two years later, Here's what the tumor looked like. This is that same picture I just showed you. And if you look at it, you can see that that looks bigger. And in fact, when we did the ultrasound, it had gone from 2.9 to 3.6. Here's that same picture again that we just showed you. And it was, so in my mind, we would have treated it even before here today. I mean, that's a, that's a 0.7 millimeter growth. But this one was watched for, uh, a little over a year and grew to 4.2. I mean, if you, if you kind of, you see this blood vessel right there, that's this one right here. And you see this one that it was right there at that bifurcation there. You see it's gone past a little bit. And very clearly that's a growing tumor. And then at that point it was um, recommended to treatment and that patient chose a nucleation and it was a mixed cell tumor. Uh, here's another one, a 66-year-old woman. She had been told in the past some time ago she's had this little spot in her eye that they'd been watching, but, but now her vision was a little blurred to her. So that's, you know, that's the symptoms uh, clue there. Uh, but it was uh, you know, just two and a half millimeters thick, but typical, otherwise typical for melanoma with uh, low to medium reflectivity and some internal vascularity. Um, uh, that was kind of at the lower limits of, of a medium category. Uh, and so she entered the COM study and was randomized to a nucleation. And it was a spindle cell with a little intrascleral extension. Uh, here's one that uh, uh, one of my classmates sent me, a uh, 63-year-old woman. She was asymptomatic, 2040. He's a good, good doctor. He had done multiple previous exams on her. When he took her cataract out the next day, he noticed this in her eye. And, uh, and so that was really concerning because he had never, you know, he'd never seen it before. And um, there's just a center down, we got an ultrasound, 2.4. Low to medium, that's, a, you know, that's kind of the worrisome category, but no vascularity. And uh, it kind of has these little almost Drusen-like things on the surface. And so we opted just to watch her and she's, about 10 years out now looks exactly like that, never grew. That's, here's her ultrasound here, and again, it's just not any, you know, it's, it's hyperfluorescent, but it's not really leakage there that you see. That it d doesn't really seem like there's um, uh, incompetent vessels there in that lesion. Uh, here's another one. Uh, I think this is that same one I showed you earlier that kind of looks like this part became 
malignant, and this part was probably a nevus. This is how it kind of evolved. 65-year-old uh, man, routine exam, asymptomatic, 2.9 millimeters thick, low to medium internal reflectivity with a questionable vascularity. And so it was watched at that time. And again, you can kind of see that that is the part that really grew right there. A year later, it went from 2.9 uh, to 3.3, so it's definitely growing there. And, uh, and again, this is one that was watched. I, we, I wouldn't have watched it beyond that, that one there. It was still watched another six months and, and, uh, and grew just a little bit. And then it was treated. It got randomized to nucleation. It was a spindle B tumor. Uh, this might be the last one or close to it. 59-year-old uh, asymptomatic. There was a little spot again noted many years before by some ophthalmologist that had seen her. And so it, was, uh, it had been followed every six months and hadn't been growing and was, you know, she had this uh, other history of a lot of other tumors that was, you know, maybe raised the question of could it be a, uh, a metastatic disease, but not really with that history. Metastasis would have changed in that time. And anyway, so the, uh, the doc who saw it there um, uh, got an ultrasound. Low reflective vascular, that's a little worrisome on the ultrasound, but, but with that history of having been followed for seven years without noted growth, although probably not with really good baseline studies, uh, they said, you know, that's probably needed. Let's do, this, do the same thing again, come back in six months. And that's what it looked like in six months. So now at 6.4, there's an inferior exudative RD, and uh, you can just anticipate that that's going to be a little worse cell class of tumor to grow in that month. That's a fairly significant growth in six months there. Oh, there's, there's one last one here, just a 45-year-old woman, 2050 vision. You kind of see this, you know, it's kind of a multi-lobulated tumor there. Uh, here's what she looked like a few months later, and, um, and here's just another picture of it even a few months after, uh, after some chemotherapy for her breast cancer. Just a reminder that not all dome-shaped tumors are melanomas in the eye. And, and one of the clues, of course, is, is kind of this multilobular nature. This probably started as a couple of different uh, foci of metastasis that then kind of merged into one. So uh, take home point if you're not going to treat tumors. When you see something, even if it's not too suspicious, I encourage you to get good baseline studies. Those are invaluable when we see these patients. By baseline studies, I mean get a good color photograph and get a baseline ultrasound. Ultrasound is very good for measuring thickness in particular, and color photographs are very good for documenting margins, and those are very, very, very helpful. If uh, most patients come in without those, and those that do are just, I mean, I get down on my knees and thank that ophthalmologist who, who did that. It just makes us be able to make the diagnosis sooner with a lot higher accuracy. All right, any, any questions then? Where do you send uh, eyes after a nucleation? Uh, up to neck, always send them to neck. Yeah. We don't I, we don't do that many enucleations because in today's world we tend to catch them when they're smaller. I mean, I do a handful of a you know maybe one or two enucleations a year it seems, uh, may, may, maybe one. Um, it's not very many. Uh, well, I mean it's a fairly rare tumor. I think uh, you know it seems like we see probably between. You know, I think the most we've ever seen in a year is close to 20, and it's more often around 10. Uh, we, we, we get them sent in from all the Intermountain states here, and uh, uh, there's, uh, you know, none of the, none of, as far as I know, none of the doctors in Idaho or Wyoming or Montana, they still keep sending them down here to us. And, all right. Any other questions? Yeah. So, so you, have you seen her? Have you? Yeah. So, uh, so her object in this is that she also has a 99-year-old mother for whom she's this care, the sole caregiver, and she has no family of her own other than like nieces and nephews or something. So, uh, her thought is, you know, I've got to die of something. I might as well live with good vision for as long as I can. I, I'm trying to get some old pictures. Dave Faber apparently took some pictures of her four years ago. They've been archived, uh, so their office is digging those out of the archive to send to me. I, I'm fairly convinced that's a melanoma. And when Paul Bernstein told me that he saw her four years ago and wasn't worried and he saw her and didn't get pictures of it, somehow that didn't happen. Uh, 
but when he saw her this time, he said, this is definitely bigger. I mean, I believe him. I think that's a melanoma. Uh, I think I'm going to encourage her to have some treatment because dying from melanoma is not a good way to go. But, but that's right under her macula. No matter what you do with that, I mean, you could, you could do TTT or laser and have instant visual loss, but localized, or you could do a plaque or proton beam, and you could probably have good vision for a few years, but you would for sure get some radiation maculopathy. Um, I'm going to try to encourage her to go see Devon Char in California, uh, just for a second opinion. He, he's, uh, uh, he's, he's likely to want to do proton beam on that or, or laser. He's, uh, um, ones that there's not a, no way to have a good outcome, and I'm very happy to share those with somebody else. I, f I feel really, really bad for her. I mean, some, some patients, their insurance won't cover them to go there. They just, they just don't have the, the ways to do it. But uh, you know, some of those back around the, the uh, small tumors back near the optic nerve, those are a little bit hard to get to. You can get to them, and we've certainly plaqued a number of those. And, you know, some of them you get surprisingly good results, and sometimes you also get worse visual results than what you expected. But uh, technically, that's a little hard to get to. The, the, a small, I mean, if you have a big plaque, you're still so on the front edge of that plaque up where you can reach it. But hers is a fairly small one. So you've got to get way back there to sew it on. And it's, uh, technically, that's a little bit more challenging. I think that's a good spot for proton beam, uh, just, just because it doesn't, it doesn't require you to do that a little bit. And, and California has the closest proton beam accelerator around. And so I, that, that's, I think, what I, I just ask her to think about that for the next week or two while I'm waiting to get these pictures and confirm that it's growing, and then we'll talk some more. But right now, she's not anxious for treatment. She's, uh, uh, and that's why I said I'm just, I'm really hoping that she's a class one, because if she is, she'll probably do well for a long time. But, uh, uh, What's her vision right now? Pardon? What's her vision right now? Uh, it's good. It's, uh, yeah, I, I guess like 20, 25 or something like that. She just has a little cataract. Everything else is normal. I think she's got a little cataract. Anyway, she has good vision. And you know, she has 2,200 out of her carotid prosthesis eye, but it's a pretty lousy 2,200. I mean, it, Dr. Ambadi did a great job to get that eye even seeing with a carotid prosthesis. But uh, I think that would be hard for her to live with just that as her only seeing eye. So I, I, we would probably still do better. The, the, her, her eye with the melanoma would probably still see better than her, than her other eye would, we, and, unless we had radiation retinopathy. And uh, I'm not radiation, not radiation optic neuropathy. So if you get the optic nerve, you can sometimes lose a lot of vision. But if you just you usually get fairly localized retin uh, radiation damage just right around the plaque and not too much elsewhere. So, and hers is small, so she's not going to get a very, very big dose. She'll have a much lower dose of radiation if you treat it when it's small. If you wait and let it grow till it's, you know, four or five millimeters thick, and then she'd start losing vision from the tumor at some point there. Then, of course, their dose of radiation goes up, and the risk of side effects go up. All right. Well, you're welcome.